Hello, I'm Vadim Maki from HTML Academy and you're listening to a special episode of Web Standard Podcast. Today, you'll hear five short interviews with CSS Queens JS speakers. Agan Ploha, Harry Roberts, Yeva Letner, Zach Leatherman and Hugo Girardel. I recorded it on September 10th, 2017 in Minsk while you were enjoying this great conference. Hi, Aga. Hi. It's the third time I see you this year, like Warsaw, St. Petersburg, then Minsk. Isn't yes. it too much? Oh, it is, definitely. <laughs> no, it's it's such a fun to see people, like, for, like, you know, worldwide, and amazing to have friends. Although we don't meet each other very often, like, we're in contact, so I yeah. think this is amazing. So I'm looking forward to the next meeting. I don't know where you're going, but maybe I'll join. Um, frontiers, maybe? Frontiers, maybe. Amsterdam. In the Netherlands? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sounds cool. Maybe, maybe. maybe. Okay. <laughs> pretty, pretty soon, the beginning of October. Yeah. Well, of course, I'm kidding. I'm glad you're here. And um, tell a bit more about yourself. Like, uh, we know, but what's your name? Like, Warsaw, Adobe, what else? Yeah. Uh, so, what's your community projects? What's your okay. favorite things? I yeah, don't know. so one year and a half go uh, me and my friend we decided to do the community work so um, we just created the organization called the awesome so we organize coding workshops for beginners um, also meetups for designers and developers and it's such a fun and I think that this is something that um, gives me energy for like daily work from five to nine work so it's something that where I can share my passion but also get a lot of energy from people so I think this is crucial and uh why why this project you decided to share your knowledge or you thought that you, you need more professionals in the in this area or like um like there's a need for developers yeah in like we, we felt that there's a niche that there are many js meetups uh, and there are some meetups for designers, but actually there are no meetups that connect these two groups together. So um, this is why we decided to to orient our work um, around HTML and CSS and show that designers also can learn it. And it's not very tough if you have a good mentor or just you, your energy is, um, is good and you really want to do this. And I think it works because we are getting more and more designers in the web industry and they're very eager to to learn how to code and to do some prototypes. Mm -hmm. So I'm really glad. And I think that currently we're having like this niche that we try to um, encourage designers to start coding. And I think that this is like a, our second mission. Okay. It is, this is so similar to what we did in St. Petersburg with uh, monthly meetups, with oh, this conference. That's great. And, uh, but we, we chose much boring name. Like just a city and technology. It's still very cool. The city is cool, so like the name okay, <laughs> is thanks. cool as well. So and don't worry. well, I can I can understand the part of uh, with uh, meetups when you, when you go and you share your thoughts or your, your experience or like telling about new technologies. But for workshops, uh, how does it work and what you do there? Like we have something similar called mm -hmm. uh, Node School in St. Petersburg, but of course it's uh, Node.js and yeah. JavaScript oriented. I wonder uh, if there's anything similar in Europe. I heard there's a CSS classes in Berlin. Yeah, th there are CSS classes in Berlin. I, I, there is also um, there's CSS JS workshops in Budapest. I know that Flaky is, is doing this. Um, so in, in Warsaw, we do have this HTML and CSS workshops. So it means that uh, we uh, meet every week, once a week. So it's like 16 hours of coding. and um, we, 16? 16, like, yeah, like eight times, uh, one times a week. So like eight times okay. because the, the meetup, like the, this is a two hour workshop. So we okay. like two hours times eight it's 16 hours and people can really, really learn uh, CSS of course not everything uh, but they can get into media queries as well so I think um, they can do a really cool projects and I think that um, this format is much better than just a one weekend because during one weekend you can yeah, okay yeah. you can learn something but you you're not rehearsing this like you are not practicing right. and here we've got like you know um the workshop week by week and it makes you like keep going and and like kind of a routine or habit that you need to code so i really like it and you can get new friends because you you yeah. you see these people once a week so yeah personally i hate hackathons 
where you yeah when there's because, a when there's a like short period of time and you're trying to make uh, something out of it and you're usually not satisfied with what you've done and, exactly and you're very tired and yeah. You're like yeah and and sometimes even it's cool like you you have a great team it only it's only for a weekend so it's like not continuing and yeah i think that having something in the long term is much more valuable so you're also bu- building community yeah I think so. Yeah, it, we we're cool. growing, so this is cool. Yeah. Um, in a couple of hours, you're going to present your Breaking the Norm with CSS talk. Um, yeah. Why do you think it's important? So you made uh, the whole way from Warsaw. Well, it's not that far away from <laughs> <Yeah>. here. <laughs> but, but, still. St- but still, still. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think it's good to like, I think that on many conferences uh, around CSS and JS, there are many talks regarding the code. Um, but there is, I think that there is, they're still lacking like kind of design talk Um, because as I said, I think that we should bring designers and developers near one table and to start discussing with each other. Um, So this is why I decided to break the norm of the conference and break the norms in CSS to show that actually you you can like coding, but you can like designing and you can combine this. Um, And I would like to show some CSS features that people probably have heard about, but maybe they're not very familiar with or they haven't used them already Mm -hmm. in the production code. So... Yeah, I hope that they will enjoy my talk. Like breaking the norm, breaking, breaking the, the conference, like breaking the law. Yeah, being rebel. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> web rebel. How would you define yourself? Are you a designer who code or a coder who design? Like it, it, it sounds ridiculous. It doesn't make sense at all. But yeah, I know, I know. There is the moment when I need to define my, when I need to define myself, and I think that for now I feel more more like a designer. Uh, because I, I have to admit that I'm sometimes lost when I talk with my friends who are developers and they're talking about React and Angular, and I'm not very into this. So at this, you know, at that time, I feel that like maybe I'm more into designing, doing UX research rather than um, exploring React or Angular. Um, so yeah, so I think that designer who code this is the my title. Okay, but but from from what side have you started? Well, actually both. So this is why okay. this is even more difficult. Because I I just wanted to create a website, and from the very beginning I was very oriented like into aesthetics and art and everything right. connected with what is visual. So I you know needed to learn how to use Photoshop. Um, but at that time I was using Paint Shop Pro. Okay. Um, yeah, it was fun. Whatever it is, <laughs> never never heard of it. <laughs> oh really? Oh wow. Uh, so yeah, it was fun, and yeah, at the same time I was learning HTML and and using um graphics editor okay that's that, that's a nice story i, I can totally relate to that I, yeah i re- remember doing similar things like both designing and coding but the encoding part yeah took just the, the, okay the whole the whole stream okay so. i I, th- I think that at that time it was called webmaster oh yeah yeah like webmaster times. or we, we used to call it them them web, web technologists oh okay oh, very the, very cool Cool. Maybe we'll get back to those titles oh, one yeah. day. When, why not? Um, is there any CSS property or specification you would li- you would really like to have in browsers like tomorrow? Hundred hundred percent support. Mm-hmm. Oh, there are many. Uh, for now, uh, pick one. Okay, pick <laughs> one. Pick one. Um, I was thinking about it yesterday. Actually, I, I forgot what was my. Um, uh, what was my um, beloved property? But I think that I was thinking that sometimes we use text on the background mm-hmm. and the background uh, when it's an image, um, sometimes, you know, the colors change are changing there. So if you have white, white font on black and white pictures, sometimes yeah. the font looks good because there is uh, enough contrast and you can read it. But sometimes when, you know, this is a background uh, size cover and it's changing um, while, you know, the device is changing. Yeah, there's a photo. Yeah, yeah. and sometimes, you know, the, the background changes as well. So you've got white font on uh, light gray background oh, yeah, and yeah, you can't yeah. read it so something that can easily easily detect contrast and change the color regarding it so yeah yeah maybe something like this um but i think that they're more useful yeah just i i just can't come up with anything better right now <laughs> yeah i think that i i've been playing with some filters to, yeah. to achieve this effect and it's still a complicated thing to do yeah so i think it, it should be easier right yeah yeah, yeah. But yeah, definitely, uh, I really like features that bring more creativity 
um, integrating coding. Uh, so yeah, something that can like remove a couple of steps in Photoshop right. uh, will be great. Yeah, well, we should just remove Photoshop altogether. Oh, yeah. Oh, maybe I shouldn't <laughs> <laughs> tell this, but I I just really enjoy designing things in the web browser. I think it's really cool and fast and, yeah. Yeah, uh, well, what about prototyping tools? Um, because, well, w when you're starting from the, like, blank index, index HTML and blank style.css, it's not very productive. But when mm. you're using something like Figma or like Adobe XD or something yeah. like this that could actually, I thought it, I think it might even generate you some code or I, it would be easier to for you to copy paste a code. Yeah, from, may, from I'm it. not sure whether XD, but yeah, I've been playing lately with XD and I have to say that it's really nice because it's fast and you can feel that that you're in the prototyping environment. Like you don't have this additional features that are just... Uh, out there and you don't use them but it's very useful um, and yeah actually yeah I, I like doing things directly into code mm -hmm. but if something we re like requires um, discussions or it's in a very early stage um, and we need to throw client to client something mm -hmm. um, yeah XD is a perfect tool for me right now I think yeah I used to use uh, when I was um, more into UX I used to use Axur but uh -huh. Not not now. Okay, it's it's too, yeah. too much. Yeah, yeah. Different no. direction. Like yeah, you, exactly. And usability prototyping. Yeah, this kind of. yeah. I agree. Uh, but maybe there is a third way. Uh, if we could move uh, graphic editors like Adobe XD towards um, uh, CSS properties that we actually use, yeah. so they will use the same naming, they set the same ideas. Yes, it would be great, and it would be easier as well for for designers to get into the yeah. The because uh, sometimes it's like drop shadow, sometimes it's box shadow, sometimes yes. it's like. And yeah, and by the way, talking about CSS, sometimes when I have like a um, like a pause or like a break from coding and when I'm getting back and I need to set col font size and color uh -huh. it's always like I'm always mixing like is it font color? No, no, it's color it's like why it's color and here we've got yeah, font yeah, size so yeah sometimes it's messy but um, and the, the last question um, I'm going to ask it to everyone today um, do you know any technology or open source project uh, created in Russian or Eastern European community, like the famous one that uh, widely known in in the mm. world? Oh, of course, BAM. BAM. Yeah, okay. yeah. This is the first one that that came my mind into my mind uh, regarding communities. Vadim knows it really. Well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You heard about many communities in um, in Russia. Yeah, in, in Peter CSS, for instance. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, BAM is the first one, I think. Okay. And it's I think it's popular like everywhere. So yeah. Cool. Uh, I, I have a list of projects. I like for for example, but I'm not I'm, I'm not going to tell you now. Oh, mm, okay. I'm waiting. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just trying to. Um, to understand if it's worth for us to break this uh, language barrier between yeah. our communities. Yeah, definitely. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Пока. <laughs> Hello, Harry. Glad to finally meet you in person. Uh, I've seen you many times speaking from Dublin to like Warsaw, everywhere. Like you're pretty active speaker. Yeah, you could say that. You could say that. And um, how did your talk go today? Like, was it was it um, successful? Was it uh, well received? Absolutely. Yeah, the talk. Um, I guess I finished like an hour ago. I suppose uh, went really well. It's um, it's interesting. Every I think every culture is quite different. So. Um, what I found today with the talk is the little exercise at the start where I get people to put their hands up. People seem a little shy to do that. But then straight after the talk finished, there was people like queuing around me asking questions. So it seems like quite an active crowd. Also, we've got to remember that it is Sunday morning. Oh, yeah. So people uh, people fresh out of bed. But no, the talk went really well. Um, really enjoyed giving it. It's, um, it's a topic I'm really passionate about as well. So I, I enjoy giving the talk. And hopefully, I mean... <laughs> I'm the least important person in that room, but hopefully everyone else enjoyed the talk as well. It seemed like they did. Okay. Um, tell, tell us a bit more about yourself. Like, uh, we know that you're running this CSS Wizardry blog and you're like you're a freelancer, um, but uh, what's your daily jobs, like your, your most famous open source project or maybe just things you're proud of? Well, so my day-to-day my -day job is I don't really have one. 
um, because it depends what I need to do at, at what time. So it could either be admin. So this morning I put a day in the calendar. Next week I've got one day of work just dedicated to receipts and invoices and paperwork. <laughs> oh, I've been, so, been, been there, yeah. Yeah, so you know the frustrations, right? So there's all like the regular day-to-day life kind of stuff. Um, but aside from that, I I'm involved in open source, but it's one of those things where open source because as you also said I, I work for myself so open source doesn't really put any uh doesn't put any food on the table so it's no. one of those things where i end up creating an open source project starting an open source project and it's one of the first things to get deprioritized because i've got client things i need to work on i need to go to a conference um so currently yeah open source isn't um a huge focus of mine because i'm focusing much more on client work mm-hmm. but i'm hoping to change that quite soon um, I've already started planning a few things around an open source project that I'm hoping to get involved in or start. Apart from Patreon kind of uh, open source support, I've seen uh, the number of professional open, open source developers which are getting like money for supporting your open source project. Yeah, I mean, there can be money made in open source if if you treat open source as your marketing. Yeah. So if somebody knows that you're really active in the... Um, react community or you're really active in the uh i don't know jquery community or whatever it is yeah, then that could lead to work so yeah you could use your open source contributions as kind of advertisement for your services but it's one of those things where there are many ways to tackle the problem um corporate sponsorship is an interesting one i was approached by a company who said look we use your open source work a lot but we're also very aware that you don't have much time to maintain it all right can we pay you to maintain it and it sounded like an amazing like someone will, someone's going to pay me to work on my own projects but then i started to realize that you know maybe corporate sponsorship would lead to bias So maybe they would say, we really want this feature. And the open source community might think, well, it's not a good idea. And the company is saying, well, we're paying for this, so we want you to put it in or we'll stop paying you. That didn't happen. That didn't happen. But it's one of those things I was very aware of the fact that mixing corporate with open source kind of mentality or ethos, uh, that could be a quite a tricky game to play. But yeah, Patreon or supporting individual um, developers' contributions is a great idea. I tend to donate to open source projects that I use a lot um, just because I'm scared of free things because free things disappear, right? Free services shut down. So yeah, I, I, yeah. I donate to projects that I find really useful. That's cool. Um, and what, what was the project they asked you to, to maintain uh, for them? Inuit CSS? Yes, it was Inuit CSS, um, which is, I'm really, I, I really like Inuit CSS. I'm quite happy with how it works and, and what it is. And mainly the kind of the school of thought behind it, but it's just one of those things where I just don't have the time to maintain. I've actually got an amazing team of uh, of developers who've just they were active in the Inuit community, yeah. Inuit CSS community, and they started just answering issues for me. So even though I was the owner of the project, they actually did way more work. So I just said to them, "Do you want to become official yeah. maintainers?" Yeah, yeah. So we've I've got like other people looking after it now. Yeah, Inuit CSS is my most Uh, prominent open source work. But do you still use it yourself or even my desk this way? Uh, what's your current boilerplate for, for a new project? So um, it would be Inuit CSS. Um, yeah, definitely. Because it, the whole point of Inuit CSS is it's very unopinionated. It doesn't look like anything. It's not like bootstrap or foundation where you have to undo a lot of stuff. Um, however, saying that, I started a project for a new client recently who they needed things custom enough that what i did is i took a like a fork of inuit css right. so what what it is is it's basically their code base doesn't include inuit css as a dependency i basically just copied and pasted it and tweaked it completely to their specification uh-huh. so their project is technically built on inuit css but it's a it's a fork of inuit but we have this uh, crazy thing like that we, we have to rewrite our front end every six weeks or something like this uh, have you i could, i think you're using this project in this stack like sas and inuit and, and everything like for, for years now like uh, have you considered changing it to something like post css plugin pack or like vanilla css i don't know i haven't yet i'm of the opinion that um if something works well then try and use it for as long as possible. So um, with Inuit CSS and and SAS specifically, Mm -hmm. it's one of those things where SAS is really well supported, very well documented. Uh, The community is enormous. If you need to recruit a new developer, they're more likely to know SAS than post-CSS. But 
I do think post CSS is incredible. So what I normally recommend is uh, transition over, maybe have some middleware, um, absolutely start using post CSS. Maybe you've got a new part of the project that you want to experiment with new things. Mm -hmm. So basically, well, it's not microservices, but it's kind of the idea of building out different parts of the application in technology you, you either want to experiment with. Because that means you can means you don't have to rewrite the entire application. And what it also means is, let's say you've got a project and you start a task to build a sub-project. And you think, okay, with, with this sub-project, instead of Angular, let's use React. And instead of SAS, let's use Post-CSS. If the React and Post-CSS thing goes really well, it means you've got a very good case study that you can use to then reverse engineer onto the rest of the project. So it's basically a way of testing out a new technology on a very small, safe project and then saying, cool, that went really well. Uh, let's start refactoring the old stuff onto this. Uh, so it just gives you a little, that, that small amount of experimentation. I guess you're spending more time doing actual clients projects instead of refactoring your boilerplate. Exactly. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. I get to... Um, I get to either join projects right at the beginning when it's greenfield and there's no, like, we can just decide whatever we want to do. Or I will go in when it's a big refactoring task, uh, which is usually the scariest. Uh, but usually then it's more about refactoring bad code than it is about refactoring into a different platform or language. Uh, apart from your recent talks, you're you're known in, in the Russian-speaking community as the one of the first... Um, people on in the western world who said that bam is a good idea mm -hmm. and uh, tried to interpret it somehow and uh, are you still um, you still a big fan of this approach or you're trying to move some to something else i'm still a huge fan of bam it's it's one of those things one of those rare things that as a developer having used bam for well over five years it still always works It's never it, it, it's never not been able to handle something. So you have certain methodologies that you think, okay, that's a good idea if these other three things are correct. Or we can use that if we make sure we use this. Whereas I've never worked on a project where BEM hasn't worked. It's very reliable. Um, it's not perfect, of course. It's like, you know, very verbose and it's not very nice to look at. But that stuff shouldn't matter. Uh, what matters is, is it readable? Is it very clear? Is the intent very clear? So yeah, I as soon as I learned about BEM, which was, yeah, a, a long time ago, I was like, this is good. I, I like this. This is good. Speaking of your yourself as a like, famous speaker and, you know, I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable, but uh, you're quite famous and I see you here and there on many conferences. Uh, did speaking, uh, did this public um, thing help you with your open source projects with, with your client work with uh, to become who you are right now was it was it important would you recommend it to developers to start speaking on conferences absolutely yes i mean i think the single most important thing for me was actually blogging mm -hmm. because um my my domain is 10 years old this year so i've had a blog for like 10 years and it was that blog that got me noticed by front trends it was that blog that got me noticed by right. um sky the company i ended up yeah, yeah, working yeah. for for sort of three years um so the blog was the first thing and then that led to the speaking and then the speaking means that uh i get quite i get i get new clients through that i guess so what will happen is i'll be speaking in the netherlands and then two months later i'll get an email from someone saying hey we saw you speak at this conference can you come and do a workshop about that kind mm -hmm. of stuff So I would really recommend it. I'd say start with blogging because blogging is easier because you don't well, have it to It used do... to be a thing 10 years ago, but now with social networks and yeah. like blogs are not that powerful and, and yeah, popular. Well, I think... Maybe vid video blogging? <laughs> Maybe. I still, think, I still think that for technical things, blogs are the kind of correct answer because they're more, they're more search-friendly, right? So what will happen is someone yeah. will Google... Um, BEM syntax and you're way more likely to get an article as a result than you are to get a video of course or, or a tweet so blogs have a little more longevity which means that think about timeless articles like uh, Ethan Marcotte's responsive yeah, web design yeah. things like that I mean that was six seven years ago maybe it was a long time ago I'm getting old <laughs> but things like that I think blogs can be really powerful because um, they're more discoverable 
it's harder to discover a video blog, I think, because they're just not as yeah, they're yeah. just not as discoverable. So I still think um, blogs are really important because you don't know who's reading. So it could be your next um, manager, like the company that ends up hiring you, could read your blog and think, "Oh wow, she really knows loads about React." Let's see if you want some interview for our company. Or one of my favorite clients, um, I won't name them, but they're great. They're a really nice company in the UK. Very, very, very huge company, actually. Uh, I got an email from them. And when I saw the emails from I was like, oh, wow, it's so exciting. Like, this is one of the biggest companies, uh, certainly in Europe. And when I asked, like, how did you end up finding out about my me? And, and it turns out the head of digital had uh, Googled something found the answer on my site, and he left that tab open for about three weeks. You know, when you do that, you leave a tab open yeah, thinking, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'll read that one soon, so I won't close it. Apparently, he did that for about three weeks, and then finally, he, he got around to the tab, and he was like, this is what we need. Right. So he sent me an email immediately saying, look, can you... It was on a Friday afternoon, and he emailed me saying, can you come down to London on Monday morning and help us doing this stuff? And that was because of a blog. So yeah, blogging and speaking definitely help um, people get noticed. Uh, I, I say blogging is easier just because you don't have to do blogging in front of an audience. Oh, yeah. You don't have to travel anywhere. You could write a blog from your bedroom. And also, um, you can take as long as you want. So a talk, you have to deliver it in 40 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Whereas a blog, you can spend three weeks on it. Uh, but also, speaking is just as useful. So I always recommend, uh, people always ask me kind of the similar thing. How do you get noticed? How do you get where you get to? start writing blogs and then just apply to speak at local meetups because local meetups always need speakers right so if you say to a meetup can i do a talk they're like yes please please you know, it will help us out um and then yeah uh, go from there i would say optimize for what you're most comfortable with if you're not comfortable with speaking then don't force yourself to do it but yeah i, I do think it's it's been very instrumental in in my career but how, how do you usually apply for a talk um do you write talk to be like 100%, at least like 80% finished, or you just um, apply with a title and then figure out once you're accepted the rest? So this is, I probably shouldn't say this, but I, I, don't, <laughs> I don't apply for talks. All right. Um, so yeah, I it's, tend it's to a... get invited. Speaking is a part of my job, so I need more certainty. The problem with applying to speak is that you need, like you, like you were saying, you, know, yeah, yeah. you forget you've done it. And it's like, oh no, I need to go and do this now. So I don't do that just because I need to manage my calendar better. Uh, I've applied for a talk before. I applied to speak at CSSConf EU and I just had a title. I had a, a title and an idea for a talk. And then when they accepted, I was like, okay, cool. I will actually write that up. So what I would recommend people do if you're applying to speak is don't write the full talk yet. Because if you write the full talk and you don't get accepted, it means you spent a long time writing a talk so what i would do is have a really good title a very good outline and if you get accepted it's like great now i've got to do the work so just optimize your time don't write a full talk in advance wait until it's actually needed and then then write it what i tend to do is i will have an idea of a topic so i knew that recently i wanted to speak more about performance and about sort of not not the obvious side of performance i wanted to speak more about the ethics and the you know emerging economies mm -hmm. So I had an idea for that. And the next conference that emailed me saying, hey, do you want to give a talk? I replied saying, yeah, but instead of CSS, would you like a talk about performance? And when they said, sure, yeah, that sounds good. I then wrote it into a talk and and you keep tweaking it every time and optimizing for different audiences. Okay, thank you for sharing. I, I think it, it might be really useful for beginners. Yeah, hopefully. Apart from BAM, uh, do you know any um, technology or open source project created in Russian or Eastern European community? Um, Just curious, because... I might do, but I don't know if I know they are. Do you know what I mean? So TJ Holloway Chuck started Stylus, and I'm pretty sure that is now maintained by... I can never pronounce his surname, but Roman. Roman Komarov. Um, so I know that's maintained uh, uh -huh. out here in Eastern Europe. He's now, he's now actually based in, in France. Oh, is he? Like he he moved from Moscow recently. I haven't seen him for a long time. Oh, so it's like, it's kind of a French product now. <laughs> but yeah, so um, not that I'm hugely aware of. I know that, uh -huh. um, well, I know that obviously a lot of Eastern European developers end up moving towards the US or the UK. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... Cornel Lazinski, who runs Image Optim, he's yeah, Polish. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, as far as people who are currently residing in sort of like Russia or or, or Eastern Europe, 
I can't really think of many. Actually, Post CSS and Autoprefixer is uh, created in Saint Petersburg. Oh, cool! So it's oh it's, yeah, well uh, there we go. So obviously, I knew those projects, but I didn't know they were. Yeah, it's and it's Andre Sitnik. He, he's a good friend of mine. He's based in Saint Petersburg. Oh, cool! So it's big part of uh, was a modern stack. Mm-hmm. So um, I feel kind of proud but it's 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 a stupid feeling but still like you're you feel like your our community is not far away far behind yeah oh i don't think that's stupid at all i think nearly everything you see is, is american yeah and the web is inherently very western if you want to build for the web all the all the sort of languages all the code is in english so it's very dominated by the west and mainly by america so it happens that when uh, friends of mine created a startup in Leeds, and they got a, a Leeds is like the city in the north of England where, where I live, and they got acquired by a US company. And it made me really proud that, yeah, someone from Leeds is getting recognition. So I don't think it's a bad feeling at all. I think it's great where you think, oh, yeah, that, that tool was from my city, and we did that. I think it's really nice. I know you're a big fan of cocktails. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. um, that, just a couple of quick questions for you. Like whiskey, gin, or vermouth? Oh, Choose one. <laughs> um, okay. If I had to choose one, I would choose gin, but only because it's the most versatile. So you can make great classic cocktails with gin. You can make uh-huh. modern cocktails. A gin and tonic is a, like a great thing to have on like a warm day. Uh, so gin just because it's versatile. So it's okay. like a strategic answer. I could drink more gin than I can drink vermouth. <laughs> That's true. And uh, another one, uh, sweet, sour, or bitter? Oh, um, bitter. Definitely bitter. So things like fanet branca, um, anything with fanet in there is, is a huge favorite. Um, I like bitter kind of drinks. I like drinks that no one else likes, so it means I get to have them all. <laughs> the worse, the better, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of friends drink the kind of drinks I like, and they're like, oh my, how can you drink that? Like Campari, for example, oh, yeah, is yeah. one of my favorite drinks of all time, and only about Three people I know actually like Campari. Everyone else is like, oh, that's disgusting. It's like, cool, more more Campari for me. Or like uh, this island whiskey that smells like... It smells like... It's really hard to compare. <laughs> yeah, it smells like island whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's the good stuff. So I quite like that, but... Um, it took me a long time to learn how to like that stuff. Uh, I some, uh, Somehow I ordered the wrong thing and they brought it to me and i had to drink it so uh, that that first time i i tried it and i never actually liked it yeah i mean it takes a long time to like um i had a really embarrassing moment with a with a client once a really really great really great client uh they invited me around to their house for dinner and um we'd finished dinner and it was very nice and we were sat there and he said uh to his wife oh should we um should we have some of the the good whiskey and i said oh this sounds cool and his wife walked over to a big cabinet in the corner and she opened it and there was a beautiful selection of different whiskeys and, uh-huh. and rums and spirits from all around the world and she got down a bottle of uh, it was Laphroaig 23 oh, yeah. and I've not had the 23 before I'd only had the 10 year so I was thinking oh this is going to be delicious and they poured it into <laughs> shot glasses and I was thinking what what you can't this is too good you can't do this as a shot so they put the shot glasses on the table and everybody grabbed one and they went, three, two, one, cheers. And I was like, oh, I guess I guess I got a shot. This, So I did a shot of this, this scotch. And as I opened my eyes and looked back up from my empty glass, they, they were sipping theirs. <laughs> and I just completely misread the situation. <laughs> and I just had, I just looked like, I looked like a British tourist doing shots. So I was like, woof. And I, I looked at them and I was just, I was like, I'm so sorry. I thought you... We're going to drink this as a shot. So I did as well, but now I look like I'm the animal. And uh, that was the, the, that, the thing is, they'd emptied. That was the last of the bottle. So they couldn't even pour me some more for me to sit. <laughs> I had to sit there with an empty glass while they finished theirs. That was absolutely... It was just a wrong glass. <laughs> yeah, exactly. you're, you're okay. I misread the situation. But yeah, that was bad. That's a shame. Thank you uh, for joining us today. Hey, absolutely my pleasure. Are you around for the rest of the conference? Of course. Perfect. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll see you around. Hi, Eva. Um, Hi. Eva, Eva, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's always complicated. It, it, it's different in different languages. Yeah. So uh, it's nice to see you again. Just for, for our, our listeners, you're front-end developers representing Vienna Mafia here. Yeah, it seems like. With, with Manuel again. <laughs> yeah, again. It's, yeah, we travel together. It's 
really weird. Sometimes it happens. Okay. Uh, what's your mission here? What's my mission? Spread the love for, for creative coding again. I think that's, that's kind of my mission in life when I give talks is make people think outside the boxes. And this time it's a literal box because I'm talking about grid. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it fit together quite nicely. Um, tell us a bit more about yourself, like your daily job, uh, home project, like things you're, you're maybe proud of. Uh, so I work as a front-end developer and going to full stack at the moment because everybody in my company is kind of building everything. And so, so I wouldn't call myself a front-end, fully front-end developer anymore. I think I, I do I guess loads the, of the, database stuff. I guess too. it called like full stack. Full stack, yeah, probably. Something fancy. Yeah, whatever that means. Yeah, no, I, I do database and, and JavaScript. I work mostly with React all day. And yeah, so I don't see as much of CSS anymore as I want to. Uh, but yeah, that's that's my job. And I love it very much. I'm, I'm incredibly lucky to have an awesome job with a great team and, and a very diverse team. And yeah, and... Other than that, I just moved to a new flat, so my life has been so this taken is your, over by So this boxes. is your personal project at the moment? So. Yeah, at the moment it's it's getting my stuff back together and, and uh, unpacking everything and building furniture. And, yeah. um, I've seen a lot of people inspired by your Peter CSS Conf talk in June. Uh, will you keep inspiring us with today's brand new talk? Could you please tell a bit more about yeah. it? I'm I'm giving a brand new talk. I'm giving it for the first time today, so I'm a bit scared for the reactions, but I think it will be fine. It will be along the same lines as my pizza CSS talk, like being inspirational and trying out different things with a new technology. So I will be talking about CSS Grid and I will give an introduction to what it is and, and how it works. And, and then in pure my fashion, I will break it and show what else you can do with it and how you can use it for creative layouting and and why we should think in a different way now and not in the 12 column grid yeah that's 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 for sure uh, we, we have to be more creative yes <laughs> any animated zombies not this time no there is no. no no animations and no life coding unfortunately okay you decided to go to the safe path yes this time it will be because it's the first time I'm giving this talk, I kind of want to get a feel for it. And oh, it's 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 much safer, definitely. Mm -hmm. Speaking of grids, uh, yes. when did grids start making sense to you? It all surprises me sometimes. It's super easy to get into. You you just want to build a thing, and you have a grid in your head, and you just make it, and it's it works, and it's incredible, and and yeah, but it has some complicated things that you need to wrap your brain around, like naming your your boxes and, and stuff like that and yeah. it's really weird and i'm i'm still trying to wrap my brain around most of the things but yeah to get into it it's quite easy like i think everybody by now can can make a tiny grid thing you can build a website with two lines of css for layout and yeah. that's amazing and uh because i teach beginners html and css and I actually now include those two lines of grid layout because it makes layouting so much easier. I don't have to teach any bootstrap so they, they can oh, make yeah, pretty yeah. websites. I just teach them a little bit of grid and they can make their pretty websites and it's awesomely layouted and they can do fun stuff. And it's, it's, a line, it's a couple lines of code. It's just a handful. And you make people so happy when you teach them because they don't have to learn a whole framework. Yeah, for, uh, yeah. for me, that moment when it like clicked and I yeah. realized that it's actually something very useful, yeah. when I um, combined uh, auto positioning, mm -hmm. auto layout uh, yeah. with uh, grid spans. So oh, when, yeah. when, you, when you can create this multiple um, well, 12 column thing yeah. and span uh, different uh, yeah. blocks across the, the columns. Yeah, I have that in my talk. I, I share a slide yeah, of that. It was the, I, thought it, it's, I thought it was cool. But yeah. when, I, when I realized that you can do combine those two techniques together, I, yeah. I realized that it's just great. Yeah, and it's, it's really so easy to build a basic grid and to do weird shit with it. It's just, yeah, it yeah. works and it's a lot of fun. It took a lot of time to, 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 to have it in our browser, so... It took a while, yeah. But, yeah, we can thank Microsoft for having it. 
<laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're they're finally shipping this uh, Edge version with mm-hmm. updated uh, grids yeah. in, in October, I guess. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I think mm-hmm. so. As for more practical matter, mm-hmm. uh, how would you implement grids? If you were like impl- implemented in on production mm-hmm. today, uh, would you um, enhance a single column mm-hmm. into a beautiful gr- grid, or fall back instead to uh, like complex flex box or like simpler flex box, but still to something like more widely mm-hmm. supported? I'm actually currently in the process of uh, making the whole website of my company grid based, new, and I'm making it grid based. Wow! So yeah, that's my project for next week. It's gonna be awesome. Well, uh, what I'm planning to do, and what I think is is a good idea, is to build it uh, mobile first, so you have graceful degre- right. degre- degradation, 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 whatever that word. So everything falls back to, and I will just make a a simple float based layout, right? Because f- even for browsers that don't have Flexbox, maybe there are people because uh-huh. our clients are sometimes on very old computers. Uh, and they print websites and stuff like that. Very odd. <laughs> but you have to cater to everybody. And if your target audience is that, then, then you have to serve the website to them in a way that they can consume it. So what I'm doing is I build it mobile first with a very simple float layout. And I will have ad supports, mm-hmm. uh, right. media query. Not, that's not a media query. A, a well, uh, declaration. Block yeah, or the, the, yeah, the yeah, a rule. Under uh, you can add add supports and then grid, and under that I will just add my grid layout and make it fancy and cool. I I think I will fall back on a float rather than a flex box. Well, it's, it make, yeah. totally makes sense. But I, I hear people say uh, these days when when we talk about grid, when mm-hmm. we post some news about it, that it's. It's too complicated to write two two parallel layout systems. Mm-hmm. Like it's might 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 be true for flexbox, but mm-hmm. for floats, you're just float left, float right, yeah. and everything is ready. Yeah. So it probably makes sense. Uh, but I would love to see the actual product, like because mm-hmm. there, there's there's nothing, there, there's no big projects uh, mm-hmm. in wild uh, yeah. using grid as, yeah. as their main layout technique. Mm-hmm. I've seen some footer links yeah. arrangements and like really tiny mm. experiments like uh, here and there I yeah. like New York Times like the, used the single property from grid layout mm. Ray. Yeah. but nothing nothing big enough yeah. real enough yeah unfortunately our designers didn't make a super cool awesome grid layout because that's also a problem we developers know about grid yeah. and that we can do cool things with it but many of the developers are not designers and the designers are in some cases not developers and they don't know about grid. They still live in the bootstrap world because we developers told them, All right. please design yeah. in the 12 column grid. And now they do that. It's now our job as developers to tell the designers, please stop the 12 column grid and do whatever you please because we can now do it. Well, to me, a 12 column layout is still flexible enough to yeah. do like almost anything you mm-hmm. want and it I, it's it's so good because yeah. it, you can have like thirds fourths mm. and like halves and yeah. everything so it's i think that's why it's so popular yeah. but still it sometimes it's limiting i've had to build calendars in bootstrap all oh, right that's a seven column grid all oh, right yeah <laughs> when you t- 12 uh, day week that's that yeah. will solve all yeah problems. and after a week of trying to find a solution that would work good i found a hack that that made my custom grid in in Bootstrap, but it was horrible. It was really bad, and I hated it. Do you think we need a Bootstrap based on grid layout, or because like developers are so used to use mm. classes on HTML yeah. to build their grids, and sometimes it it's easier probably instead mm. of. Uh, Going to CSS, you're already there in HTML and you can, I don't know, try something new. Yeah, but didn't we all learn about the separation of concerns? Well, we have single page applications with everything's mixed. I know, and it's kind of... Old fashioned thing. Yeah, but for me still, the markup is the markup. That's the elements that are on the page and the design is in the CSS and that's how I feel it should be but i grew up like that i i learned that and we don't really need a framework for grid because grid is its own framework to quote rachel andrew um 
So we don't need to have Bootstrap with grid integration, really. What Bootstrap is amazing at, and, and I don't hate Bootstrap, but what it's very good at is building something quickly, like yeah. having a nice quick demo, building a template for just trying stuff out so that it looks pretty. Like when you code a new functionality and you want to show your shareholders, you don't have to have the whole design implemented. You just do it on Bootstrap and it takes 15 minutes and you show them and yeah. it's fine. But using it in production, you have to do so many things to hack it and to make it different yeah, and yeah. and to, to strip all redundant styles yeah exactly and yeah all the amounts of lines of code that you will never need and oh, yeah. yeah no i'm i'm not a huge fan yeah i i don't think we really need that i think some people will never get rid of bootstrap or other css frameworks because they're so used to them and they like the classes thing but then again i like to build style guides And then you have the classes thing too, so you can mm, build yeah. your own tiny framework. And especially in you know in the world that I live in now, the React world, we have style components. So you yeah, have yeah. your built-in style guide because you just have a list of all your components, and everybody just copies the the component in, and it works the same way. You don't need a framework for that because you build the framework by building the style components. Something completely different. Um, yeah. Do you know uh, any technology or open source project created in Russian or Eastern European community? I probably do because I probably use some, but I, I have no idea which ones. I've, I've been just asking this question to to all uh, speakers today uh, because not I'm 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 going to brag some, about mm -hmm. something or like. I want to feel proud or something like this, but because I, I just want to understand how big problem is, how mm -hmm. divided our communities yeah, are. Yeah, exactly. That's a problem. So, like, bam, is a typical is is is, 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 yeah. is, is is Yandex. Yeah, thing. I yeah, knew like, that. Yeah, yeah, I knew that bam came from. Yeah, uh, like post CSS auto prefixer. Yeah, that they all like built uh, good, by a good friend of mine, Dre. Yeah, and yeah, so. Yeah, I guess we need some work to do in this area. Of course. To, yeah. to promo promote uh, it, not by just third hands, like some third party people, but yeah. but ourselves. Yeah, exactly. And that's why I love coming here. It's it's a great community and, and Belarus. It's, it's, the feeling here is very similar to when we were in St. Petersburg. It's just it's a very nice community and interested people. And yeah, it's it's super cool being here, and and like I don't feel like I'm bringing the Western knowledge because it's <laughs> that stupid. But yeah, yeah, I like to share what what I've been working on, and I like to learn what you guys have been working on, and and it's it's a lot of fun to exchange that. And I know it's a it's also a language problem because we come here with English because that's apparently the language yeah, of the yeah. web and and not realizing that it's not nobody has not everybody has the same access yeah, to yeah. english that we do so we are kind of spoiled with especially in austria where we learn english at five years old or something sometimes so well i guess we will remember to 2017 for the first two english-speaking conferences yeah. like st petersburg minsk yeah and, and i've maybe, been at both <laughs> yeah so you'll be remembered for that <laughs> Oh, thank you for coming here. Today. Thank you so much. It was so nice talking to you again. And good luck with your talk. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Zach. Um, I never thought I would see you speaking in Minsk. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, like, thank, thank you so much for coming here. And um, yeah, thank you for having me. This is great. And I'm. Uh, A bit surprised. I always thought that your skin color is green. <laughs> yeah, I've had a long tradition of uh, green tinted avatars in my social media. So uh, I've just carried that forth. Every time I change my picture, it's always a green tint just to maintain some continuity. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't know if it's a good idea or not, but <laughs> I, I, I hate when people change their photos, and yeah. it's it's really hard to 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 figure out who's that new person in my timeline. Right, the photo is uh, how you identify people. Yeah, yeah. visual learners identify but, by your photo. But now you uh, have a special way of changing changing photo, but still keeping the same. Right. Yeah. I don't know if it, I I don't think I'm the first person to do it, but okay. I don't remember why I started doing it. I just like the color green. I guess I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, what I did, I just 
created some nonsense logo like 10 years ago. Ah, and, okay. I, and I still use it everywhere. Nice. So it's it's like it's it's my personal brand. Ah, okay. Yeah. I would yeah, say. I like uh I like using my photo just to I don't know, get my face out there and have people recognize me maybe. Yeah, when well, I go to conferences, but I don't know how effective that is. <laughs> but well, speaking of you, um could you please tell something about yourself like your famous in Russian community for font font loading performance <laughs> kind of things what what else do you have in your life uh oh just personal wise uh, personal professional where do you what what company you work for oh, sure. what what you do what's your like favorite uh what what the most popular open source project you manage or sure uh so i work for a company called filament group we're based out of boston but we're fully remote i think it's five five at people full-time and one part-time person. Um, so very small. Uh, we're a consultancy. But so we well, do, well known. Yeah, we do uh, a lot of uh, performance consulting and uh, design work for various companies. Um, so yeah, it's a very good company to work for, for sure. Uh, primarily because they value work-life balance. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't work a, a lot of overtime. We get uh, a lot of good family time. Um, so it's a very uh, effective company. For sure, because we put in our hours, we work hard, um, and then we go home. So it's a great job for sure. So uh, if you're if you're having problems with uh, font loading or something like this, uh, at least in our community, we go read article by Zach or <laughs> Bram. <laughs> right. Yeah. Is is, is, the, is it is he your colleague as well? Uh, Bram and I don't work together professionally. We have reviewed blog posts that each other have written. Uh -huh. um, So I would consider him a friend, even though I've never met him in real life. Really? But we've chatted online, yeah, quite I, a bit. I, I, uh, I follow both of you on Twitter, and I uh, see how you're chatting, like you're like best friends. So. <laughs> yeah. We're you... very kindred spirits in that we study uh, the very same specialization. Right. Uh, he works for Adobe Typekit, so oh, his is uh, right. his uh, professional job is maybe more relevant to font loading and and things of that nature. So, um, but we we are very kindred spirits for sure. That's that's interesting. Uh, I always thought your colleagues. Uh, uh no, uh -uh. <laughs> just good friends. Okay, that's good, good. virtual friends. Sometimes uh -huh. it's even better. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah it's good. Okay. Uh, did you know how your name so would sound in Russian? Uh, no, I have no idea. You're a Zach. Yeah. Like full version is gotta be Zachary. Yep. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, but we have a very similar name in Russian, Zahar. Okay. So, in and your second name uh, is could be easily converted to Russian, like like not tr even tr translated. So it would be Zahar Karevnikov. Oh wow! That's, so there is uh, a. Co I won't even attempt to pronounce yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll write I'll write it down to, for you in Cyrillic and Latin, so oh, great. you would yeah. know because it's you could use it as your like nickname. <laughs> yeah, I wish I you know. would have. Uh, Maybe I'll have time to work that into my slides before I speak this afternoon. When I was a kid, my uncle used to call me uh, Zakharuski. <laughs> Zakharuski. I don't know if that has any... Uh... It doesn't make sense at all, but no? I, I, okay. know, I, I know what it, what, what it means. Like ah, it, okay. might, it might... Well, it's just just, just, just a joke, but yeah, it's, it's, sure. it's, it's funny. Yeah, I didn't think it meant anything, but yeah. Um, thanks to you, I learned a number of uh, very weird abbreviations like FOAT, FOIT... <laughs> And even even foft, foft, yeah. Is there anything else? So all of those were sort of channeled from the original, which was the flash of unstyled content, yeah, which is yeah. Falk, Falk. Falk, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think more people are familiar with that. And uh, so the names all branched from that original one, and that's more tied to just how ba basic CSS loads and blocks rendering and all of that. Um, and so font loading sort of borrowed those terms and reappropriated uh -huh. them or whatever. Um, so. I don't know. You should you should invent the, the fourth, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I did uh, come up with Foft. Foft. That's yeah, my yeah. creation, but uh, yeah, it's weird to see people use that <laughs> for sure. Just because I don't know, I just came up with it out of nothing. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, once a week uh, we record uh, in in HTML Academy. We record short videos called HTML Shorts. Ah, okay. As shorts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there was a one uh, video uh, when I where I explained uh, how font loading works and what's the best way of loading fonts, and I introduced this concept uh, like with of foft, foit, 
vote and nice. whatever. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was funny to like put everything in, in, in a row and realize that, oh, this is actually a system. And I wonder if there's anything else. So I, I was thinking to ask you and I have a chance now. So Yeah, but, I don't think there's any uh, other ones other than those three. Um, certainly there could be more just because the those three don't encapsulate all of the different yeah, strategies yeah. that are available. Um, but I kind of felt like there were three is too many, <laughs> or three <laughs> yeah. is enough. <laughs> yeah, people got kind of tired of the acronyms. Like just just in a text, it doesn't make sense at all. <laughs> yeah, just so, saying them verbally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's is it's, awkward. It's <laughs> sometimes even painful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Speaking of strategies, what would um, <clears throat> what's your favorite phone display value? I mean, favorite in 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 a way that as a, is a, as a good that you could um, suggest someone using by default. Sure. So. Uh, I don't know if readers will know or listeners will know about uh, font display. It's a new CSS descriptor that goes yeah, in your we, font face Yeah, we're, we're talking about this in our podcast a lot. Okay, a great. Lot, a lot, so. Okay, uh, so my favorite is Swap. I like Swap. Uh, it's sort of the traditional fout. Uh, show the unstyled text until the web font loads and renders. Just like uh, IE or itch work. Right, right. So the default behavior for those. We should, we should, we should have called it IE. Right, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, I don't know if other browsers would have adopted that strategy <laughs> if it had been known as the Edge IE approach, but they've actually had that since uh, 1997, oh. uh, which will be in my uh, talk uh, shortly, in, a, in an hour or so. Um, so yeah, I like Swap. Uh, if you're using more than one uh, web font for the same typeface, mm -hmm. so say you have a Roman font and a bold font together, I like to do uh, Swap for the Roman And then optional for the right. bold or italic uh, variant. So basically, foft using using font display. Right, exactly. Yeah, you're very uh, knowledgeable. Maybe you should be talking about font loading here <laughs> in an hour. Um, um, so yeah, that's a a great way to sort of uh, use font synthesis, which mm -hmm. is the way to sort of the browser fakes a bold or italic font um, on initial page load, and then uh, with your repeat view, it yeah, yeah. will use all the web fonts together. So. Is there anything else we need for better font loading? Uh, Preload and font display, we have it right now. Uh, we will have it in more browsers. Or so. yeah, it's, But is there anything else we could do to make it better? Uh, yeah, uh, I would say that anything... So the, the sort of the goal, I think, is to eliminate as much... Not just eliminate the FOIT, which is invisible text, but also to reduce as much FOUT as possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, because you don't want to be reading an article and then have the web font load and have the metrics all change and sort of uh, jump the position that you're reading at. Uh, that can be very awkward, a very awkward transition. So I would say the two big outstanding problems are to sort of reduce uh, the FOUT reflows that happen mm -hmm. and then also to you want to sort of group your repaints together uh, so you don't have oh. weird race conditions between right. multiple fonts loading uh, at the same time um, and one major thing that's coming that will help group repaints um, is variable fonts so in one individual true, true. variable font file that you load uh, asynchronously obviously um, and then all of the variants will uh, repaint at the same time yeah we once invited uh, some typographer like real typo typographer to nice. our uh, peter css conf meetup uh to tell what's what, what what's all about because from our perspective it's gonna make fonts smaller and lighter and everything but what's inside and he told like the tremendous story about what's going on inside of this yeah. open type format and yeah. how it works and it was it's incredible the, the danger with variable fonts is that uh Uh, so the approach I described with font display where you use multiple properties, swap and mm -hmm. optional together, um, it will sort of extend your fout, right? Because it, the variable font will be bigger than the singular Roman font that you yeah, load initially. Yeah. Um, so it will extend your fout time a little bit. Um, so what I sort of recommend is to subset a very small version of just the Roman font mm -hmm. um, and embed that into your page or even preload it once preload is a little bit better browser support. Um, but, so it, that but, you can, it, but it's still two fonts instead of four. Right, right. It's still going to be better. Yeah. Um, but again, you're trying to, there's two different goals you're trying to do there is to reduce the amount of fout reflow um, and group your repaints together. So mm. two big problems. And um, 
final questions, a completely different one. Do you know any technology or open source project created in Russia or Eastern European countries? Uh, I don't know, any from top of your head. Oh, well, uh, I mean, everyone yesterday was talking about PostCSS, yeah. uh, very famous uh, Russian author, I believe. Yeah, Andrei Sitnik. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I guess that's probably the most well-known one. Uh -huh. uh, I can't think of any others off the top of my head. BAM? Oh, BAM comes from? Oh, yeah, I didn't know. Yeah, okay, yeah. It's, nice. it, it's been invented in, in Yandex. Ah, okay. It's, all right. nice. it's yeah. Russian Google. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm uh, a little bit familiar with Yandex. So. Yeah, yeah. So, nice. Yeah, but I've been just trying to understand how, how, how big is How, how big problem is between uh, how is isolated our community ah, from, from right. the rest of the world yeah. because we have a lot of smart people in it and yeah, we, absolutely. We, we, it's really hard for us to share our, our ideas. Yeah, I kind of see a, a smaller parallel between um, because I run Nebraska.js which is a meetup in the middle of the United States and mm -hmm. we're kind of isolated from both coasts. All right. So we don't have a ton of people living in our area Um, but just flying above your head from coast to coast, right? They call it the flyover state. Um, <laughs> but we kind of have a, a similar problem where we're a little bit isolated from the sort of the bigger development hubs. Um, yeah. So we have a lot of smart people that live and work there, um, but our ideas don't get sort of don't permeate into the bigger developer communities as much as we'd hope. So I kind of see uh, what you guys are going through. We don't have the same language barrier yeah. uh, problems mm -hmm. that uh, that exist, but. Uh, The same problems are trying to be uh, solved by by people that live in the United States too. So anything we can do to help you, anything you can do to help us to sort of merge all of the communities together is will be great for everyone. So that's what my my good friends did here. They they yeah. inv invited uh, a lot of uh, foreign speakers and they they made it the, the whole event English speaking. So yes. I, yes. it's 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 happening for the second time uh, this year. And for the first time, like this year, it's the first year where we are trying this. So we did did it first on Peter Cesar's conf mm -hmm. in June, yeah. and now we're they're, they're doing the same in Minsk. And uh, it's one thing to 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 announce something, but there's another thing uh, to get to get attention from speakers. So yes. so thank you for coming here. Yes, and, absolutely. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I have been very impressed with how well organized the conference is. Um, it's amazing. I've been taking notes for our conference next year That's cool. uh, about some tips and things that you guys have done that I want to adopt. So, uh, yeah, very, very well-run conference. Hope to see you in Europe, Eastern Europe, or even Russia more. We will, yes, we will definitely keep invi inv back. inviting yeah. you. Anything I can do to help merge the two yeah. uh, big communities, I'm down to help. So Cool. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Hi, Hugo. Hey, hi. Is it Hugo or what's, it, what's the proper? Um, well, in French, because I'm French, uh, in France, uh, we pronounce Hugo. Hugo. And then in Germany, they pronounce it Hugo. And right. then when I, pronounce, when I, I say it, um, I pronounce it the English way, so Hugo. But it doesn't really matter. Uh, how did it feel to know that uh, in some way, in some Russian community far away, someone discussing how to pronounce your name? <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. Like I checked that. Uh, I've, I've seen that the other day. I was like, uh, that is crazy. Um, you know, with people just taking care of pronouncing and writing names correctly. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and that's some, that's something I never even considered. Like this is not something we, like Latin uh, people uh, using Latin character even have to think of. You know, yeah, yeah. everything is always like this um yeah that's pretty fascinating it's uh, it's really interesting so i translated the conversation to just uh -huh. see a bit of uh, what was said um and i know some of the contributors to this con to, be, to this con concert our oh, conversation sorry so it was uh yeah it was it was a lot of fun it's very yeah nice. we, we, we started this dictionary repository to <laughs> yeah. just um, uh, collect everything we do in one place uh, we, we we translate a lot uh, english articles mostly to to russian so we need uh, the same Ter, uh, the same names Terms, for, the, yeah. for, for yeah. the same things, and then mm. then we re realize that we always write uh, speaker or after author names uh, in different way. Yeah. So we decided to collect this as normalize, well. Normalize, yes. Normalize, and yeah, it's 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 been a good resource for the whole community to 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 speak the same language. So it's. But really that's uh, that's super interesting because um, 
um, like uh, the Russian community seems to really care about having Russian materials to uh, so translate yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. like English English speaking materials into Russian. Um, I don't know if um, so many countries have such a like such a, a care around around the translation itself. Like, for example, in French, uh, in in France and in the French community, we we do uh, quite a bit of translation, but there's not this like uh, consensus around you know making all everything uh, available in, in 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 French. I think a lot of people are just comfortable reading English at least. Okay, but uh, um, can you imagine monthly English speaking meetups somewhere in France? In Paris, yes, for sure. For sure, I think in Paris it wouldn't be a problem because, um, well, there's a very international community, so actually it could be a good thing. Then in smaller cities, probably not because, you know, um, less people there, smaller yeah, community, yeah. and then even smaller portion of people being comfortable in, enough in English. So, yeah, uh, probably, probably not everywhere, but Paris and maybe Lyon or big cities like this, yeah, I think mm-hmm. it, it could be possible for sure. But it's not even possible in, in, in Russia yeah. because we, we were trying, uh, like, Eastern European Russian speaking communities because we uh, this year uh, we tried for the first time to organize English speaking conference uh, I mean I mean 100% English speaking conference not just two speakers mm. and the mm. rest is Russian Russian um, we did it in St Petersburg and this is the second conference in, in the same manner uh, they organized it in Minsk and it's it's starting it start changing because it the, 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 there's a huge history of uh, Soviet Union and Russia trying to isolate itself from the other world yeah and uh, we're trying to overcome this legacy yeah. That's, yeah, that's what's um, happening yeah that's funny but even uh that's what i noticed on SAS guidelines um because uh, we had a uh, we translated it in 13 or 14 languages and including uh russian uh-huh. and um there seemed to be so quite a few people taking care of that at that point at least um so far we, we're lacking of a bit of contributors on, on the russian language but um it seems always to have this kind of a uh, side uh, community just taking care of, of those like topics in Russian, oh, yeah. um, which was uh, less I've, I thought less present in the, at least in Western Europe and uh, Western languages. So like Spanish, Italian, Gr- uh, Greek, and so on, where people were just a bit more kind of all participating to the same projects. Um, so it's definitely uh, interesting and probably a, maybe a cultural a bit of a cultural thing behind it. Well, enough about us. <laughs> your your guest today. So uh, I know a thing or two about your interests. Like I, I used to, I used to read a lot of uh, your SaaS related uh, articles. Since now you're switched to more accessibility and diversity direction. Yep. I hear you're working on React or something like this. But uh, could you please explain what you're doing? What's your daily job and responsibilities and who you work for, like company or open source communities, anything um, really? Yeah, so I, I work at N26 in, in Berlin. So it's um, like a mobile bank. So we, we have this uh, very strong focus on making every, your, your whole bank account um, uh, available and manageable from your smartphone. Um, so that's, that's what... Even we, from smartphone browser? Um, so mostly from the app, but uh, we, we, we're heading towards a bit a bit... Web, a bit more web focused as well, okay. um, at least considering the web as a first class citizen and not just you know uh, leftovers. So um, yeah, working there for a year now, and um, um, I, I I got hired, and with a friend of mine, we got hired to uh, rebuild the web platform basically because oh, uh, right. the, the the previous one on the cur- the current one is a bit outdated. Um, it's built in Backbone, um, and so we we kind of rebuild the whole. Uh, infrastructure around that and we are building everything in react um react and uh, graphql and uh, so the daily life is um we work in distributed in distributed teams so we have um we have a product team if you will we have a team uh, dedicated to the new website a team for uh everything about the user acquisition a team for insurance a team for credits um so you know things like this and um we we work in agile. We work uh, with uh, Scrum, so we have like mm-hmm. quite a quite a steady flow and a, like a, a good one. Um, but in terms of technologies, in terms of uh, technologies, so you're free to choose whatever you want. Yeah, that's that was the nice thing. Like we joined this company and uh, we well, they hired us to say, okay, you can you basically you have um, like a, a clean a clean a clean table. You can just do whatever. Yeah. So we discussed a lot about the technology choice, but we were. Uh, working in React before, so we knew that uh, we knew how to deal with that. So we went with um, like an Express app, and on on top of that, so we have a React rendering um, 
we started with Redux for state management, and then we moved uh, a bit more into GraphQL and Apollo. Um, styling is done with Fela, so CSS and JS. It's pretty cool. Um, and then we have a like a super strong focus on testing. We have a QA engineer. We have the, the amazing opportunity to have a QA engineer. She's from Minsk. Oh, right. um, she's uh, she's really great. So we have like accessibility testing. We have end-to-end testing with Cypress. Uh, we have um, unit testing, of course, with Jest and so on. So we kind of try to build this new web platform with a, with a like a focus on quality. Yeah, basically making it robust so it can last a decade or, you know, uh, and not being That's having cool. to be rebuilt in two years because it's falling apart. But uh, it mostly React and CSS GS for you now. But yeah. uh, how do you feel about writing those weird uh, functions that do a lot of weird things in SAS like you used oh. to? Like, like uh-huh. you used to? Uh, yeah, good times, man. Good times. Uh, <laughs> the SAS years. Um, no, I'm done with that. I'm really done. Um because SAS, you because I, you switched the project or because you don't believe in, in, in this um, anymore. So I think I moved more into JavaScript at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, so with React, and um, I also realized that SAS didn't have to be there. Um, we had all of the solution first CSS modules, then CSS and JS. Yeah. So I, I kind of naturally uh, stopped a bit using SAS. Uh-huh. Um, and SAS also lost a hell lot of momentum. Like, uh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, the, uh, the, main, uh, the main author, Natalie, had uh, to uh, move to another project. So she wrote SAS but in Dart instead of Ruby. Oh, yeah. um, I know that the, the Node SAS team has been a bit um, like reduced as well. Uh-huh. Um, so, you know, SAS so was it, there at a, at, a good, at a good time for a good reason. And then slowly, little by little... Browser caught up, and then the JavaScript ecosystem caught up, and then there was a bit less of a need for that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I just um, kind of stopped, to be honest. But it's still it's still very good, and I think in a lot of little projects, small infrastructure like Jekyll or things like this, yeah, SAS yeah, yeah. is probably better than CSS and JS because it's just simpler. So no more SAS for me. <laughs> um, I, I feel I feel the same. Like I I decided to stop using it uh, altogether. Like. Couple of years ago, because I have a, I had a, a opportunity to experiment. Yeah. And yeah. When you have a have this, you, you always try to try something new, like post CSS or whatever. It depends on your on your stack. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. Speaking of alternatives, um, do you think uh, React and CSS and JS is the is the answer to all, all our problems, or is just a temporary solution? <laughs> um, Tough question. I know. Yeah. Well. Okay, so two things. For React, I think React is a library. You know, it is what it is. It it's it's a great one. It's very well maintained, and so on and so on. I don't know if it's gonna stay. Nobody knows. Uh, but it definitely changed the way we think about building applications, like for sure. Um, both in a in a from a technical perspective, uh, with you know having a virtual DOM, a strong focus on virtual DOM, and then uh, basically. Leveraging the fact that we can handle everything in memory and then translate that into actual DOM modification. So this is the first one. And then the second one is on the very componentized approach. So this is not new, of course, but I think React made it easy to think in a matter of component, much much more than some other libraries or frameworks for that matters. So I don't know if React is going to stay, but the the, the paradigm paradigm shifts mm-hmm. it, 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 it created um, definitely... Is not going anywhere, I believe, at least. Um, for CSS and JS, it's a tricky one. Um, CSS and JS is not uh, is not magic. Like, I mean, in the end, it's still CSS. So there's a lot of fuss about it, but the the the, the only I think or the only valuable um, valuable arguments around that is that it plugs nicely in a re- in a JavaScript stack. It pl- it plugs nicely with React, for instance. Yeah. Um, so it's more convenient, but if tomorrow we, we lose CSS and JS, you know, uh, hypothetically, it's not a big deal. Like, we know how to handle CSS, we know how to, yeah. how to use CSS, and putting it in a JS file and a CSS file, it's not that different. Um, it might be more or less uh, um, um, practical, but yeah, it's not, yeah, in yeah. the end, it's the same language. So, I mean, I do like CSS and JS, and I have no problem with putting everything in JavaScript files. I think if you talk about separation of concerns on where on which type of file you put your code in, I think this is wrong. This is not this is not what separation of concerns is. Um, but it's not it's not dramatically better. You know, it's in the end it's still CSS. And if you don't know CSS, CSS and JS is not any better for you. So yeah, yeah. and there there's uh, so many use cases for classic uh, applications, yeah. web applications, yeah. not 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 
not something jQuery based yeah, web yeah, apps. Yeah. I mean, this this was the ugly one, <laughs> uh, but uh, for like server rendered. Yeah. yeah. So it, it doesn't make sense to have CSS and JS there. Yeah. So it's just single page thing. Yeah, and. Not everything has to be a full-blown single-page application with React, isomorphic, and Redux. You know, we almost all of us have a little blog or website or whatever. Seriously, uh, HTML and CSS and JS is just fine. Or you know, static site generator like Jekyll. You don't need to have a, like a full boilerplate of yeah, well, thousands of lines of JavaScript and node modules. And I've seen I've seen too many React basic static generators. I mean, this this is interesting in a way. Like I I find. React based static website generator kind of a kind of a nice touch because in the end they basically in the end they just they just generate uh, static static files right so HTML CSS but whatever. it's so complicated so <laughs> many modules so many infrastructure okay that's the thing but it is more complicated than a Jekyll but is it really because the thing is Jekyll everything is in Ruby so you don't even see the source basically so it's hidden yeah exactly complexities ex- exactly like and and in the case of something like uh, I think Gatsby like a yeah, React yeah. generator like a static site generator um, it's a bit less hidden it's a bit more on configuration side and then you can leverage the power of NPM and node modules which is pretty nice you know is it necessary for website uh, like small website personal blogs yeah probably not well, but, if you get used to this React stack, exactly. it, it's, it would be much easier for exactly. you than to than then to learn, you know, uh, li- liquid, 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 liquid. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly that. I mean, static website with React is a is a technical implementation detail at this point. In mm-hmm. the end, they generate just um, static pages um, uh, that works with JavaScript because it's they generate the content, and you can just statically host that anywhere. So you know, why not? Um, this is. It's interesting. I work for a small company in St. Petersburg, Russia. It's called uh, HTML Academy. We teach students some basic HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and uh, some advanced JavaScript. But we don't. We're not planning to teach them like Angular, React, or Vue or whatever, because we're we think it, it, everything is changing so fast. So it will be become redu- redundant. Uh, so it, you have uh, like a lot of nice videos explaining like React 15, but it's already 17. So what you're supposed to do? Do you think it's worth? for young developers, for beginners to learn some specific um, um, things apart from basic web platform technologies? Well, that's a tricky one uh, because when you start working in the real world, you're not going to just handle the fundamentals. You know, you, like nobody's having website in HTML, CSS and JavaScript pure like vanilla anymore. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's, you know, you could say we need to prepare them to um, like their first job. But at the same time, as you say, maybe when they reach their first job, whatever you taught them in specific libraries and frameworks and uh, whatever is going to become obsolete because yeah. it's ever going to become outdated or even like non-existent. I think uh, something we should prepare newcomers um, more to is uh, things like, for, instance, for front-end developers, things like design, accessibility, um, and performance, uh, you know, like those side topics, but which in the end make a hell of a lot of a difference and which in the end are kind of core of what we do uh, for mm-hmm. a living. It doesn't matter if you use React or Angular. In the end, what the user need is a, a fast website that can uh, show some dis- decent content in a decent way and uh, ideally without being a problem to access it for yeah. any kind of user. So looking back at how I learned web development um, in school and, and during my studies and all that, uh, this this was what was missing. Like we taught us a lot of things, yeah. um, like HTML, re- re- real world application yeah, of your knowledge. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because we taught us like HTML, CSS, uh, a little bit of JavaScript, uh, PHP, MySQL. Uh, because this is what we did uh, in, yeah. in this courses, fan off. But um, we taught um, taught us how to implement design in i six because at that point it was still somehow a thing. But we never really taught us that uh, users do not uh, all browse the web the same way. Yeah, we yeah. never taught us that a, a performance is money. That you know, um, uh, fast is 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 money. Being fast is money. Uh, we never taught us that um, uh, design and typography has some heavy con- consideration, and that it's not just a designer work. So all of that, basically, I think this is this is what's missing from most learning. And it's. Bring, bring us to the topic of your talk. You're speaking about this diversity and, and, and inclusivity, and uh, those topics are still considered as something artificial. 
in our community. Like you're trying to create problem out of nothing and it doesn't matter. And I'm 100% on your side because I spent a couple of years like in, in Norway working for a European company. I probably know more about this thing because it's normal thing for European community, for example. But here people just laugh. And uh, why should others care? I don't know. What's What would be your advice for, for Russian-speaking community? Why should they care? Why should they take the, this, those problems seriously? Yeah, that's interesting. Because um, when I got invited to speak about um, to, to speak here at this event, uh, so I was I was excited and I said, well, um, the thing is I don't do technical talk anymore. I, I would like to talk about diversity. Uh-huh. Um, I, and, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, because um, they inv- invited me to um, talk about either CSS or JavaScript, you know, uh-huh. like a, doing a technical talk. And I said, well, um, no, I'm done. I'm done with that. Um, so happy to come, but I'd like to talk about diversity. So I said, yeah, sure. Uh, but some people told me, you know, it's it, it might not be a very receptive audience for this kind of topic. I was like, yeah, fair enough. Let's, uh, you know, we wing it and then we see what happens. Uh, that's okay. So coming back to your question, uh, this is um, <laughs> this is hard because I I think I don't know how to tell people they, that they should care about other people. Like it feels it feels so natural. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, yes and no. Um, no. For, for those can like for, for for those topics that I tackled in my talk, like you know having having uh, diversity in the way you, we ask for names and gender online yeah, uh, yeah. or in application for that matters. Um, I do understand that. Until you you face a problem yourself with this kind of thing, it is hard to empathize and to yeah. to even to understand. Uh, I do understand that some people can think, yeah, but we have better we have bigger problem than that. You know, this this is like the way it is is fine for most people, so it's good enough for sure. It is like yeah, in most cases, um, first name last name is fine, and binary system for gender is fine. Um, I, I mean, at some point, you gotta ask yourself if being fine is just what you want to aim for or if you want to build a good product, a good user experience, an inclusive one. Um, but I do realize it's it's very hard to uh, really care about that if you're not really impacted by that. Yeah, I don't have an answer for that. Why would you care? Because that's, um, you know, being a good human being, I guess. And and that's that's what I try to underline in my talk. You don't you don't have to understand. Like there are, there are many things um, we, we just, go with, but we don't necessarily fully understand them. We don't have to understand why some people prefer uh, acting like this or behaving like this or it, identifying uh, themselves like this or naming themselves uh, like that. We don't, we don't have to understand that to respect that. Like, um, we can just, you know, roll with the fact that people are different and then say, okay, it's a tiny wee bit more work, but at least people can use that. People can just go with it. Um, the same way people can think, yeah, we have bigger problems than that, I can also reply, you have bigger battle to fight than those. So just go with it. Make the little ex- extra step to make everybody happy with your platform. Yeah. And and it's just much better for everyone. It is hard. It is hard to convince people to yeah. care about those topics. It would be its accessibility, inclusivity, yeah, diversity. Yeah. And uh, sometimes I, I think mm, it's not for us to decide because it's if community is not ready, the de- developers wouldn't help. If if you're not accepted as a person, as who you are, as a, as a, as someone di- who's different, then you wouldn't dare to specify a different gender on your yeah. profile. Yeah. So it's it's bigger than that, but uh, I think your what you're doing is is really good. I mean, uh, I'm I'm grateful for that because <laughs> no, no one I haven't seen any talk in Russia uh, regarding this this thing, and well, that, that, that's that's great uh, to have you here. Yeah, um, yeah. I'm I'm also happy, you know, talking about that. And um, as we as we said, you know, if people um, kind of disagree or don't really see the point, that's you know that's fine, but. Yeah, I think that's a bit of a shame, but I can't I can't convince people that this is super important. It's just um, food for thoughts. Yeah, exactly. This is this is kind of the way I see my talk. Um, if you if you don't understand that, or if you just don't want to bother tomorrow in your next project, at least you know keep this in in the back of your mind. Mm-hmm. Just remember that, be it in um, the way we name people or the way we we identify um, each other with gender. Uh, we're always a little bit different than the next person, and it's good to keep keep that in mind uh, when we design and build things. You know, yeah, um, yeah. It's 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 a, it's a great principle in general. Yeah, um, yeah. 
exactly. And very last question, uh, like completely different matter. Um, do you know any technology or open source project created in Russian or Eastern European communities? Something famous, something you use every day? Yandex. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, BAM. Yandex BAM. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's uh, that's the right answer. <laughs> yeah. That is that is hard. That comes back to what I was saying a bit earlier. I feel like those communities are so disconnected. In that, a way. That's why that's why I'm asking um, <laughs> to, to to check if it's true, uh, and it's it seems it, I mean, it is. I've seen contribution from Russian speakers uh, on on some uh, topics, uh, mostly on documentation, mm -hmm. um, like size guidelines was was yeah, an, exam yeah, yeah. an example uh, with a, a Russian translation, um, simplified JavaScript jargon as well as yeah, yeah, yeah. SJSJ uh, with a Russian translation as well. Uh, but I I can't say I've seen. Um, or used, for that matter, um, Russian-speaking projects right away. But they, they're usually not Russian-speaking. They, they're rather uh, created for someone who identifies it himself. That's, that was a rather, rather question about community. Post-CSS? True, or the prefix true serve? very true. Like, and, and it's funny because um, I do know, uh, I, I, I know, at least you know, I've seen on Twitter and... I've, Andre? Uh, yeah, and, and, um, and some other... Um, Excellent, like fantastic Russian or uh, uh, Russian Russian speaking people um, doing uh -huh. a hell of a lot for the the community JavaScript and the CSS and so on. It's just um, yeah, but it, for, you know, for, at the same way, I could not tell you a Spain a Spanish uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. topic either or our library. But yeah, um, but, but partially this question related to how open we are as a community, and the, this conference makes makes it easier for us to to hear each other to understand each other so i'm just just thank you for coming here and and yeah. b bring us community closer yeah i'm also very happy to just you know come here and have a kind of bridging the gap with the yeah, russian speaking yeah, yeah. community um it's it's super nice um it's it's very different from what i'm i'm also used to on a daily basis uh but i think it's you know it's it's not any better or worse it's just nice to connect and see how we can how we can work together towards a better web i'll be glad to see you again somewhere likewise likewise it would be a pleasure thank you thank you very much this is it i'm vadim mckeef from html academy and you were listening to special episode of web standard podcast don't worry we'll keep releasing our regular news episodes every monday in russian but tell us if you like this one and we might try to record something similar in the future bye